Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar, which is part of the Biotech Startup Series um, organized by uh, Biolabs and Servier. This is a regular uh, series of conference or webinars um, in these distantiated times um, that both of our organization uh, put together to gather entrepreneurs in biotech. Now I would like to um, introduce um, our speakers. Um, Johanna Michelin from uh, CNRS Innovation, the CEO of uh, CNRS Innovation. Uh, Brandon Hochstadt, who is the uh, business uh, development manager with um, NYU Langone Health. And Martinson, the senior director of technology transfer at Tuft University. So um, if you would, I would like to ask you all uh, to turn your camera so that uh, the audience can actually see you and um, to um, introduce uh, yourself uh, briefly, maybe a few words on yourself and your um, how you uh, are now where you are. Uh, Johanna? Uh, yes, uh, thank you Jean-Jacques and hello everyone. So my name is Joanna Michelin and I'm the CEO of CNRS Innovation uh, since uh, three years now. Uh, I have a background in intellectual property and business law and I joined the National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS, uh, 12 years ago. And I started working with researchers, uh, supporting their submission and management of uh, European research projects. And I also participated in the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. And then I uh, joined the Tech Transfer Office uh, of CNRS as uh, its uh, CEO. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, Brandon? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brandon Hogstead. Uh, I'm with NYU Langone Health's Office of Therapeutics Alliances, which is a virtual biotechnology accelerator within NYU. Uh, and it's kind of a sister office to the traditional tech transfer office. Uh, and we operate under the umbrella of technology venture partnerships. Um, so I joined NYU's Office of Therapeutics Alliances about three years ago. Uh, I have a PhD in immunology, uh, and I do diligence on a... My, my job is to essentially evaluate the, tech, the uh, research coming out of NYU and uh, figure out which research can become uh, new potential uh, therapeutics. And we set up de-risking uh, projects to, to do that. But I also work with the uh, traditional tech transfer office uh, in patenting and licensing um, any technologies. Thank you very much. Martin. Hello everyone, my name is Martin Sun. Um, I am the uh, interim senior director of the Tufts University Office for Technology Transfer and Industry Collaboration. Uh, I have a background in physics and physical sciences from Harvard University, and I've been in the field of technology transfer for, for about 25 years. First at the Harvard Tech Transfer Office and now at the Tufts uh, University Tech Transfer Office. Um, uh, during my time here at Tufts, uh, I've been involved with uh, helping to commercialize Tufts University technologies from across scientific disciplines, uh, both in partnership with entrepreneurs and startup companies, and as well as larger established companies. Thank you very much. So um, when we talk about technology transfer, I just would like to um, give a few, um, a few pointers and, and numbers to set the scene. And those numbers come from the um, Association of University Technology Manager, the AUTM, which is a reference in terms of um, uh, TLOs and tech transfer. So out of the 200 organization that replied to the latest survey, um, those organization uh, filed 17,000 patents, so it'll be over 17,000 patents in one year. Uh, they provided uh, uh, nearly 10,000 licenses and they created 1,000 startups. Uh, so that group of, um, of technology transfer offices give access basically to 70 billion US dollars of public R&D to the private sectors. All I can say is you guys are really busy beavers. 
and really doing a lot of stuff. So um, maybe to describe a little bit more your organizations now, what, what does it encompass? And maybe let's start with, with uh, Martin, a traditional university, if I may be so bold, and I don't want to be reductive of the tough, um, innovative spirit, far from that. Um, so what, what, is, what do you encompass within, um, within your realm? Sure. So uh, Tufts University is uh, perhaps a bit more modestly sized compared to some of its uh, peer institutions in the Boston area. Uh, but having said that, it is uh, very well-rounded uh, with strengths in many um, scientific disciplines and, um, and um, innovation areas. Uh, it's comprised of four campuses. Um, the campus that most people think of when they think of Tufts is the Medford campus, which is a suburb um, north of Boston. Uh, in, on the Medford campus, we have our traditional arts and sciences school. All of our undergraduates um, uh, are housed on the Medford campus. We have our school of engineering. We have the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy for international relations. We have the Tisch College of Civic Life. Um, on the Boston campus, um, we have the uh, many sort of life science related uh, disciplines represented. We have a medical school, dental school, nutrition school, a graduate school of biomedical sciences. Um, out in Grafton, Mass, which is uh, about an hour uh, west of Boston, we have our veterinary school, which is the um, uh, one of the uh, uh, best regarded veterinary schools um, in the US. Um, we actually also have a uh, fourth physical presence in Talwar, France. Uh, we have the Tufts European Center where we conduct special programs and events. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do more of that again as we arrive at a new normal. Um, um, so the, uh, the university also has two physical business incubator spaces physically residing um, at, at Tufts. Uh, in partnership with Biolabs, we have the Tufts Launchpad Biolabs uh, incubator facility, uh, which is a startup uh, incubator facility with wet lab benches and office space um, situated in the, in the heart of um, the uh, Boston uh, Tufts campus in, in downtown Boston. We also have a biotechnology transfer center, which is co-located with our veterinary school, where many companies, small and large, have established a presence uh, and take advantage of the fact that the veterinary campus and the large animal um, facilities are, are right there. Um, I'll also mention that we have a very close relationship with the Tufts Medical Center, which is a separate entity. Uh, and is the university's primary affiliated teaching hospital. Uh, and we are also very physically um, close, right next to each other on the Boston campus. Well, that's quite a few activities and, and campuses. Um, um, and uh, I guess you are um, dealing with the technology transfer uh, for all of those entities. So thank you very much. Brendan, NYU, NYU Langone, Describe us a little bit of the landscape there for your research activities. So NYU Langone is uh, is affiliated with the uh, New York University uh, uh, downtown as well. Um, we we have a lot of research co covering a, a swath of disciplines, including oncology, uh, neurology, immunology, uh, across the basic biological sciences. Um, and as we do uh, the NYU Technology Venture Partnerships, we do cover uh, all of the NYU campuses, including the downtown campus, uh, which uh, has many chemistry labs and engineering labs, as well as the, uh, the Tandon School of Energy in Brooklyn, which uh, has, has um, a range of engineering and biomedical engineering uh, laboratories there. Uh, we do also cover the NYU Abu Dhabi campus, which has some laboratories and some technology coming out of there. Um, so we, we also have, uh, so as I mentioned, I'm part of the NYU uh, Office of Therapeutics Alliances, the OTA. Uh, we are a particular, um, we're a very specific uh, model of uh, biotechnology accelerator in that we actually do the active uh, de-risking of uh, early stage technologies to make them more appealing for potential investors, such as entrepreneurs, pharma companies, biotech companies. Um, 
so we do we do actually operate as a, a, a virtual biotech company in that way under the under the umbrella of NYU. Um, and uh, we also do did recently open up. Uh, we we have a partnership with BioLabs. There's the NYU Langone uh, BioLabs, which is uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, so similar to uh, Martin's incubator over at Tufts, uh, it's an incubator space that uh, tech that startup companies can you know get a get a foothold in some uh, physical lab space as they're starting up. So we have a uh, you know here in New York City we have a pretty uh, up and coming, robust uh, startup ecosystem that uh, that entrepreneurs and um, biotech companies can tap into, and um, you know, really build early stage technologies here. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Brandon. And yes, um, you can see a theme here, and um, and BioLabs is indeed uh, active both in uh, New York City, uh, in Boston, and on both. Um, on both shores of the U.S. Um, Johanna, I'm going to uh, turn to you now to uh, describe a little bit the remit of um, uh, CNRS innovation. Yes. Um, so um, CNRS is one of the biggest research organization uh, in Europe. Uh, we um, have about 11,000 researchers and they operate in all fields of science um, through around 1,000 laboratories uh, that we share with French universities and engineering school, uh, but also, even if it's less common, uh, with uh, industrial partners. And so uh, CNRS Innovation is the technology transfer office of CNRS. So we are uh, in charge of the protection of the research results through IP. Um, we also have a funding program uh, in order to uh, increase the TRL and uh, as for um, what Brendan uh, just uh, described, uh, in order to make those technologies a little bit more uh, appealing to our industrial partners or uh, more likely to be uh, at the basis of the creation of a spin-off. And we also then have the activities for sure of commercializing um, this IP, either to existing companies or through the creation of spin-offs. Um, CNRS doesn't have its own incubator, uh, mainly because uh, we're, uh, our labs are located through whole France, um, but we have partnerships with a, with a series of incubators, uh, investors, um, and also um, advisors that they can, can help our uh, spin-offs to structure properly and to reach the market in the best conditions. Thank you very much, Johanna. Uh, so somewhat similar activities for, for all of you, but um, different, uh, different playgrounds, if I may say so. Um, and, and when we look um, at um, uh, how you may interact with, um, with young companies, uh, I, I first would like to put myself in the shoes of an entrepreneur again. And um, uh, it's, it's a busy life. It's a complicated life of um, any uh, biotech or deep tech company, whatever the field may be, actually. Um, got to develop the technology to the next uh, proof of concept so that uh, can progress the, the, the company. We have to organize the team, hire the right people. We have got to raise money. And uh, in our conversations together, it became clear that you think that um, at the same time, the companies still need to expand their, their technology horizon to look for additional technologies. So uh, we'll get into how and, and the mechanics of it all, but maybe first, why, and jo Johanna, can I, can I challenge you with that? And why do you think, um, as an entrepreneur, I need to come and talk to you? Well, I think it's important for, I would say, two main reasons. Uh, first of all, um, you and your company are um, into an increasing international competition, and it makes it mandatory to keep up with the latest developments. This is why you might want to keep on with R&D programs that are uh, obviously deeply connected with your project, but which are uh, maybe a little bit more fundamental uh, than your actually current product developments. Uh, the, the second reason I see 
uh, and it's especially true for biotech uh, companies, um, is that the, the value of your company relies not only, but a lot on the value of your IP. And as time goes, your patent portfolio ages and it's uh, uh, important to renew it and strengthen it. And, and, um, and those, for those two uh, reasons, interaction with technology transfer office can be really useful uh, in order to identify maybe um, research uh, groups uh, that uh, you can co-develop new results with or um, by getting a license on existing patents that can, um, can strengthen your uh, patent portfolio value. So a friend of mine, uh, CEO I was talking to on this subject, mentioned that he basically kept about 20% of his R&D money spirited away and did not really report to the board what he was doing uh, with that uh, kind of secret fund. Uh, good idea, bad idea. Um, do you recommend everybody does keep some money for, I would say, not uh, mainstream R&D, but to just reinforce um, kind of greenfield IDs or, or patent acquisitions with board approval, maybe? Well, I, I mean, I would say, um, I think it's always good to um, let your board know what is it exactly that you're uh, doing and especially in, in research programs because it's, it's basically the strategic future of your company that you're uh, trying to foresee there. Um, but, um, but I think it is a good idea to, to have a part of your R&D budget, which is targeted on, um, I, I, I wouldn't say it's side projects. I would say the best would be that it's more fundamental and more risky projects. You don't know if they're, uh, the, those projects are gonna turn into an actual product for your company later on. But um, so, so it, it's in that way that's, that it's maybe a bit risky. Um, but with the, this particular part of your R&D budget, you're actually addressing the future. And I think for a company, it's always good to for sure take care of your short and midterm um, strategy, but you also need to address a long-term strategy. And this would actually, I think, look good uh, to your board. Um, okay, so we need to refresh the, the, the portfolio and make sure that the value of our IP uh, keeps um, growing. Um, and, and have a, a broader portfolio. Uh, Brandon, Martin, how, how can I find the right technologies coming from, from your spots? There are lots of patents out there. I mentioned, I forget how many thousands, but I, I just want one, the right one. Well, oh, uh, you can go, Martin. Oh, sure, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, Pretty much every institute, research institution now um, has a direct online presence, uh, their own website, and 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 many institutions have uh, technologies developed uh, at their institution available for licensing, um, displayed hopefully in a uh, searchable capacity directly on their their own web presences. Um, there are. Um, obviously other avenues to be able to take advantage of from, from the tech transfer office perspective, we, we try to make um, technologies available for commercialization, searchable and findable through any and all avenues possible. Um, uh, I would like to certainly point out uh, one very um, uh, useful uh, such avenue, which would be the Autumn Innovation Marketplace or the AIM platform. Um, and in full disclosure, I'll, I'll say that I'm the chair of the AIM uh, committee for Autumn, but it is uh, a portal site that Autumn, the, the association that um, was uh, previously referenced that um, runs the annual licensing activity survey, um, a portal site that was created to be able to help all um, member institutions um, upload technologies available for licensing and commercialization um, to that platform so that as a seeker of technologies, you can go to the platform and have in one location the ability to search and hopefully find 
uh, opportunities coming from hundreds of institutions um, in the US and, and even uh, beyond the US. Um, there are a number of uh, sort of portal sites and platform sites like that, that um, certainly um, uh, we can provide um, links and references to. Brandon, other uh, ideas on? Uh, in addition to what Martin was uh, saying about uh, online directories, uh, I think there's nothing that can beat a good old conversation with your local business development managers at the, uh, you know, at a university tech transfer office. Um, the the directors and the managers of the of the uh, technology offices, um, you know, part of our role is to have. Uh, have relationships with uh, all of the university professors and for us to keep our fingers on the pulse of the research that's going on at uh, the universities that we cover. Um, so, you know, oftentimes like part of my daily job is speaking with the professors, speaking with the students, going to poster sessions and really keeping tabs on everything that's going on. So, um, you know, talking to us is, is a great way to, you know, for us to learn about what you're interested in, what types of technologies, what stage you're interested in, and we can really tailor fit the conversation to find uh, technologies that you might be interested in. So we can kind of uh, uh, curate the process for you uh, in that way. So in addition to online uh, searching, you can just talk to us and, you know, we can build that uh, conversation and oftentimes developing an ongoing relationship between a, a uh, tech transfer officer um, and, you know, a company can lead, you know, maybe the first conversation doesn't lead to uh, that spark of, wow, this is the perfect technology. But if you check in regularly, new technologies are always coming up into, you know, onto our uh, portfolio and into our pipelines. Uh, so regular conversations saying, hey, Brandon, uh, what do you have? Uh, is, is there anything new and interesting that you have that's, uh, uh, you know, target discovery or uh, a validated target or um, chemical matter in, you know, oncology or in immunology. Uh, and then, you know, we can just get the conversation going. Johanna, would you recommend to do that as well? And do people call you with those kind of questions? Yes, of course. Um, I think this is uh, for sure the, the kind of basics you, um, you need to do on, on a regular basis. And it's really, much easier if uh, you're in an environment that allows that on a campus or in an incubator that is uh, allowing those kind of interactions at the coffee machine actually. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there is also um, another kind of interaction that you can have uh, not on such a regular basis, but maybe with a consultant or professionals that are gonna help you to make a diagnosis of um, your IP portfolio and on what side it could uh, it could get stronger um, because it's it's not just about having as many patents as you, you could afford more or less it's also to have a, um, a, a patent portfolio that uh, with a, with bricks that really fit together and this is actually a, a part also of the job of the TTOs to give you advice on that looking at your portfolio and saying I think there is one brick missing there and maybe uh, I can help you find it or develop it if it doesn't exist yet. Um, but um, if you don't talk about this with a TTO, you can also talk about this with consultants. Um, there are lots of them that uh, offer those kind of services. And for sure you don't do this every month, but uh, once every one or two years, it's important to ask yourself, what is the value of my patent portfolio? Is it uh, correctly protected? And compare yourself with a competition on that as well. So just a, a message here to, uh, to the audience. Um, we uh, welcome the questions. We have received uh, two questions now and uh, please keep them coming. We'll, we'll get to those questions in, in just one minute. I, I'd like to kind of shift gear a little bit now and, and go towards um, the, the actual uh, you know, let's get into this conversation about licensing IP from, from you guys. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always in the, in the mindset, you know, my company is certainly not a Google, it's not a Servier or a Sanofi. And I will have to convince you uh, maybe that my company is actually a good fit for this patent that you own. And I have to, um, to convince you 
what what will you ask me uh, if I'm trying to um, come to you and say, well, you have this great checkpoint inhibitor, um, and uh, please give it to me. I I want it. All of you. <laughs> I guess I can comment uh, first and then Joanna and Martin can um, build upon anything. Uh, I know that for, for NYU, we really are concerned about finding the the best partner for our technologies because our interest is, uh, you know, we, we are a nonprofit organization and we are mission driven. And at the end of the day, our goal is to get our research um, to be translated into uh, commercialized uh, therapeutics and medical devices. Um, and, you know, actually com successfully commercialized technologies. So we, we are very concerned about finding the best partners that will actually develop the technologies and ha that have the resources. So we will ask questions um, that will, uh, you know, we will in inquire about uh, what resources you have, what, what are your sources of funding, what's your history of, uh, you know, who, who is in your organization, um, you know what? What uh? What past successes has your your group had, or the individuals in your group? Um, you know, and any evidence of success or uh, evidence of uh, the proper resources and the proper skill sets, including um, you know, if if you are a company that has historically only dealt with small molecules, and we're licensing you a biologic, you know, we we would want some reassurance that you have the capacities to develop biologics, whether that's consultants uh, or the right uh, contract research organizations. We want to, we want to see uh, a work plan and evidence that you're putting in thought rather than, and thought and intention to develop rather than just acquiring a patent that you will put on a shelf um, to presumably add value to a company. We're less concerned about adding value to a company uh, and more concerned about actually developing the technologies. So these are the kinds of questions that we'll, we'll generally ask. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add as well that um, um, uh, echoing uh, Brandon's comments that, uh, you know, it is absolutely important to find the right best partner. Uh, it doesn't, that however, doesn't necessarily mean that you all, you have to be a large established company with the experience um, uh, you know, many years of experience built to demonstrate that you, you, you've already done this. Um, you know, many of the technology opportunities coming out of universities are very early stage in nature. Um, and while many might fit very well in a pipeline for a biotech or a pharma company, some, some require additional dedicated R&D, uh, maybe a focused uh, effort that perhaps only an entrepreneur or a startup company can, can offer. And so, um, I think part of finding the best and right partner is uh, on both sides being able to demonstrate a flexibility to, 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 to be able to ensure that perhaps on, on day one, you don't have all of the resources at hand to be able to take a technology through the commercialization, but you, hopefully you'll have a business plan and strategy in mind that can help you get there. And um, from, from our perspective as a technology transfer office, we don't have to go straight to a traditional commercial exclusive license agreement with all of the financial and diligence obligations up front. We can, we can start um, more flexibly, perhaps provide a limited term option for, for the parties to get to know each other better for the uh, commercializing entity to be able to start getting some of the pieces in place to, to demonstrate to the tech transfer office that it is working towards the ability to become a, uh, a good, best fit commercial licensee. So uh, a, a question um, for your own objectives. Um, how are your organizations being measured? How are your performance measured? Are you trying to get a lot of money out of me? Is that the most important thing? Or the, uh, one more deal uh, is good? What are, what are the key metrics that you will be measured on? Um, I can start for CNRS, for example. Um, so um, as, as Brendan said, our 
main goal is to have our technologies turn into products that are available on the market and that are useful for society and uh, economy. And so um, um, my KPIs are not uh, based on, uh, on uh, the, the amount of money uh, we will uh, get back on royalties. Um, it is uh, for the, the KPIs are more uh, how many of the research, the technologies that are coming out of our labs are being transferred um, to uh, companies and made available to the society. So for sure, the more um, license we sign, the better, but it's not just about signing the license. Uh, as Brendan Martin said, it's also about that after signing this license, the developments continue, that the project is not put on a shelf and abandoned, um, meaning our investments in research was right and is being pursued um, by our partners. So this is these are the for, for us the 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 keys uh, in our evaluation is how much of our research results are actually reaching the market. So we, we have a lot of questions that are coming in, and I thank you all for that. Um, I would like to remind you that uh, there is going to be a networking session after the webinar when you can interact directly. So if you have direct questions for any of our speakers, uh, you should be able, uh, we hope, to um, have you talk to them directly and, and potentially exchange. Um, there are several questions on company formation and how you help on that, but maybe a last one on the terms, again, that might be important. So I think, uh, Martin, you alluded to that, uh, doesn't have necessary to be exclusive licenses. Uh, do you guys have minimum royalty rates or um, how can, again, wh what can I expect financially from, uh, from a conversation with, with any of you? The way that uh, we like to look at it is that for any given technology um, commercialization opportunity, um, you know, with a sense for what industry it would be um, um, useful for, the potential value of that opportunity in the marketplace, given what is uh, currently existing in the marketplace, um, we try to gen to develop a, an overall sense for the value of the opportunity. And again, we're quite flexible in trying to um, fairly have that value reflected in a license relationship with, with the company. All that to say that we don't have an absolute uh, minimum royalty requirement um, or you know, very specific floors or ceilings for any financial term really. Um, we do have a good sense for what are considered to be sort of industry norms in terms of royalty rates and, and fees and, and et cetera. But um, we have a number of financial considerations that we can uh, discuss. Um, and depending on, again, the, um, um, the early stage nature of your, your venture or uh, where, how far along you are, um, certain, certain financial considerations might be easier to, to offer than, than others. Um, for example, for a startup company, equity is probably an important consideration that the company would like to, to provide an offer. And so we're willing to accept that and see how that might um, 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 contribute to the overall value that we seek and, and how it might be um, uh, reflected in, in you know, differing terms uh, that we may negotiate in, uh, in other parts of the license. So an interesting question that came in, and I'm sure people will relate. Um, it feels like um, you are uh, overworked and understaffed. I want my conversation with you to be priority. How can I stand out? Uh, I would say if you, if you reach out to any of us, uh, if you're able to tell us briefly what your, you know, what your company is interested in, um, and what stages of technologies you're, you're interested in, uh, that, that will help us assess and prioritize and triage uh, more quickly. Because if somebody just says, hey, we're interested in licensing uh, technologies, what do you have? Uh, there's, there's a more of a barrier to understanding how we can actually work with you. So the more information you can provide in terms of what you're looking for when you reach out to us, the more we'll be able to, to look at your, you know, 
when you contact us, we'll be able to look at your situation and get something in motion. We have a, a couple of questions with regards to company creation or, or ensuring um, that the technology flows out into uh, a company, not necessarily uh, through a straight license. Um, do you get involved in uh, helping select the team around the project to facilitate um, a, a spin out? How do you manage the transition or, or console a scientist who may be a very good scientist and may not be the best CEO? Joanna. <laughs> um, so uh, we get involved uh, in the in building up the team for, of a spin-off when it's necessary and needed. Uh, sometimes, uh, for sure, I mean, the, the, the researcher, um, the inventor of the technology is always at, at the basis of the creation of this uh, startup because, um, as Martin said, the results are still very early stage and uh, um, the involvement of the inventors is key uh, in the next stages of the development. But then, for sure, um, other types of profiles are going to be necessary to make it a success and either um, the researcher happened by it, it by its net its own network um, to find the right profile and we agree with that and and then all good or either we help him uh, find the right co-founder um, and for that I mean I'm sorry but I don't have any magical recipe um, we use our own uh, network, we use uh, events, uh, we use uh, hosting offers online, um, we use every canal uh, that we can find because it's actually a very difficult topic. It's very difficult to have the perfect match uh, in terms of uh, capabilities um, and in terms of personality as well, because you're going to started um, an adventure uh, that is going to be very uh, time and emotion consuming and uh, the fit between the partners is, uh, is actually key. Jean-Jacques, I also want to add um, to, to everything that Joanna said, um, the notion of uh, the inventors being, uh, you know, whether or not the inventors uh, are brought into the company or whether or not they are, uh, you know, suitable to be either a CEO or a CSO, um, there are other options in terms of incorporating the inventors because oftentimes uh, it will be in the best interests of, uh, you know, of the licensees to have the involvement of the inventors ongoing. So rather than uh, keeping a narrow mind of, okay, they must be somehow on the executive uh, um, board or uh, executive, uh, the C-suite, um, oftentimes we have, a, we set up agreements where the inventors uh, are some kind of a, uh, they continue on with some kind of a consulting agreement. Um, so in addition to just licensing and having, you know, we do have, we do have professors that become entrepreneurs and become CSOs and become CEOs, but not, you know, many of our professors want to continue being scientists um, and, but also care about their science uh, being commercialized. So they will, you know, we'll, we will set up agreements where they will uh, be consultants. Um, and also one, one more additional thought is that licensing is not the only option. Um, so, you know, you, people can come to uh, a tech transfer office and say, okay, we want to license this or that, um, but patents aren't the only thing. Um, and you don't, you know, even, even doing an option is, where you say, okay, we're going to have this option period where if we reach a milestone, then we can license. Um, you could also do sponsored research agreements where uh, the where you can enter into a collaboration and provide either certain kind of funding reagents or um, or or other other uh, resources, and you know that that uh, that sponsored research could also have a built-in option or first right of refusal for any in inventions associated with that. So there's there's many different ways to to create um, you know a partnership. With, uh, with academia, not just licensing. Brian, thank you very much for th that reminder because um, that's a whole uh, another set of relationships that all of you are managing and we didn't have time to, to cover. Um, maybe um, I, I, one reminder to all the attendees, we are going to um, reconvene very shortly to a networking session. 
where uh, you will have an occasion to uh, talk in small groups to each of the um, uh, panelists. Um, and uh, there are many questions that have come in and we're sorry that um, we cannot uh, take them all. They were all very interesting. So I thank you very much for, um, for those interesting questions. Um, I don't want to go over long, so we are already overshooting the time that was allotted to um, uh, the webinar. So uh, I would like at this stage to really thank all of our panelists for very, very interesting comments and, and really uh, um, uh, workable comments. And I'm sure that you will have more questions uh, in the breakout sessions uh, in talking with individual people. So thank you all for participating. Uh, we look forward to um, seeing you all again, maybe uh, soon in the next uh, webinar that we will organize of the Biotech Startup Series. Again, thank you and uh, see you very soon, I hope, in the networking session. Bye-bye.